so today we will talk about the, the strong CP problem. When we look at the standard model, uh, Lagrangian, uh, at the renormalizable level, we can, respecting the, the point carry invariance as well as the gauge symmetries, we can write a term which is given by this, this formula here. So we can write a, uh, uh, g a mu nu, g tilde a mu nu coupling, where g, g tilde is the dual field strength of the of the gluon field. Note this epsilon mu nu alpha beta uh, levi civita four dimensional tensor. So this operator once again is can be added to the standard model. In fact, should be added as any other. Um, other term in the Lagrangian, it is renormalizable, it, it respects gauge symmetry as well as the Poincare invariance. Note that uh, this operator vi violates CP. So CP is the transformation, combined transformation of charge conjugation and parity inversion. So the operator violates CP. So here, um, a are the group indices of SU3 color, while mu and nu are the Lorentz indices, which run from zero to one to three. Okay. So why do why do we often uh, ignore ignore the, the, this operator? Uh, well, it turns out that CP is a very good symmetry of strong uh, dynamics. This we know from the experiment. In fact, this represents a great puzzle. The, 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 the fact that we can write down an operator that violates CP, and yet we have not observed effect of it uh, in strong interactions in, in experiment. So these lectures will, uh, will, will, will try to convince you that we indeed have a problem, which is called the strong CP problem. So I will try to argue that this parameter theta bar is physical. In particular, that it cannot be rotated away in the standard model. So we really have to establish that this is a physical parameter and that we that the theory predicts CP violation. This will be the big part of the lecture. Then, then we, we will calculate something which is called the, the neutron electric dipole moment. It's an electric dipole moment of a neutron, which has been constrained experimentally. So there is an upper limit on this quantity. So far, there is no evidence of it. So there is only an upper limit. And this upper limit can actually be translated onto this fundamental parameter, theta bar. And in fact, um, the experiment tells us that, that this parameter should be absolutely tiny, 10 to minus 10. In other words, we, we, have, we are not seeing CP violation in strong uh, interactions. However, this, uh, this is a bit disturbing because we know that CP is violated. CP is not the symmetry in nature. In particular, we have measured CP violation in the electroweak interactions. And we actually measured the CP violating phase, the CKM phase, and it's actually order one. So the strong CP problem is the following. Why is CP violation so much suppressed in the strong sector? This question for many people um, points towards the existence of physics beyond the standard model. We, we have already discussed problems or puzzles related to small numbers. Note that this puzzle doesn't have uh, an anthropic argument behind, uh, behind it. For example, the, the, the cosmological constant is tiny, but there is this anthropic reasoning that if it was not, uh, we didn't have that value, the universe wouldn't form for us to be here. The, the same argument can be uh, to some degree argued also for the Higgs electroweak scale with a lot of caveats, but it's not definitely as strong as for the, for, for the cosmological constant. But here for the, for the CP problem, the strong CP problem, there's absolutely nothing wrong with having it large. 
okay? It's a parameter in the theory. And if you, even if it was larger, there would be nothing wrong without, uh, without, without universe. So indeed, this seems to be a problem which really points to some underlying structure beyond the standard model, which explains the smallness of this number. Okay, this is why it's interesting from the BSM perspective. So there, there are two branches of, the, of uh, model building that try to address this problem. Why is this number so small? The first one is called spontaneous CP violation models which try to um, say that at, at uh, very high energy CP is conserved, then there is a spontaneous violation uh, of the symmetry. And the challenge of these models is to generate large CKM phases while having very small uh, theta parameter. I won't discuss these models. Uh, the, the second class, which I will actually discuss very much, are based on the so-called peche queen symmetry. These Pechenkin symmetry are uh, global symmetries, which are anomalous under QCD. And uh, I will try to discuss anomalies to a great detail in this talk, in which when, when we have the symmetry in the theory, basically we will show that the theta parameter is unphysical. Okay. And this way we will solve the, 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 the strong CP problem. And there will be a leftover particle, uh, which is called the axion. Okay, so th this was the, 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 the introduction. Um, and basically the outline of this talk. And the literature which I recommend and used for these lectures are the, 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 the strong CP problem talk by uh, Michael Dine and um, Axion lectures by Giovanni Villadoro from GGI 2015. And then finally, I used some, some things from the um, Matthew McCall's lectures on physics beyond the standard model and the, the textbook, quantum field theory and the standard model. Okay. Um, in particular, I highly recommend to watch the, the lecture notes by, by the lectures by Giovanni Villadoro, which are publicly available um, on, on, the, on the GGI website. So the, the anomalies will play, play a key role in discussion of this problem. The, um, and uh, anomalous symmetries. So I will uh, start really from basics, starting from, uh, from the discussion of, uh, of symmetries in classical theory and then moving to quantum theory. Anomalous symmetries will be symmetries that are classically realized. So they are the symmetries of the classic Lagrange, uh, Lagrangian or action. But at quantum level, they are broken. Okay. So we will start with the Noether's theorem, which says that if we have a continuous global symmetry of the Lagrangian, the continuous global symmetry of the Lagrangian, continuous meaning that there is a continuous parameter that parameterizes the group transformation. Um, global means that this parameter does not depend on the space-time point. It's global everywhere in the, in the space-time. Um, one can show in very general terms that there is a conserved current. There is a conserved current on shell. On shell, once the equations of motion are respected. So let's have a look how, how it works. Let me take a Lagrangian which is a function of the field and the derivative of the field and do a, a symmetry transformation. Meaning when I do a, when I change the field by some Delta Phi, the Lagrangian doesn't change. Okay. Under this global continuous um, um, transformation. And this is, this is uh, the, the, the symmetry. Okay. Invariance under this transformation. So, we can do this variation. And when we will go get, get several terms, uh, I'm pretty sure you're familiar with this. So I will just tell you that, that, that eventually once you impose the equations of motion, so meaning putting on shell, going on shell, then 
from the fact that the variation, this is the symmetry, the variation of Lagrangian is zero, we see that we have a conserved current. Okay. So the conserved current means that, so there is a current uh, mu uh, Lorentz vector. It's, it's a function of fields and the function of space time point, of course. And then there is a space time derivative. The, the derivative mu j mu equals zero. Associated to this current is the conserved charge, which is the, the, the volume integral of, the, of J naught. And one can see that taking the derivative of the charge with respect to time, time derivative, uh, one can transform the, use the, the, the conservation of the current and, and transform the volume integral into the surface integral. And provided that fields drop fast at the infinity, the charge is conserved. Okay. So very important example of global symmetries re relevant for this discussion for CP, strong CP problem has to do with the phase rotations of, of, of fermion, okay? So let me take a Dirac fermion, Psi, which has, a, a, it's, a, it's a direct sum of the left chiral fermion and the right chiral fermion. So it has these two uh, components. And let's see what kind of symmetries, global symmetries this Lagrangian has. So I have one species of a Dirac fermion. So we have the kinetic term which we can write separately for the left component and the right component. We could also imagine that we have, for example, a gauge symmetry, U1 QED, okay? In such, such a way that the ordinary derivatives are covariant derivatives. Still, uh, there is a global symmetry of the kinetic term of the Lagrangian, which is U1 left times U1 right. we can rotate independently left chiral field and the right chiral field with independent rotations. And these rotations are given here. So uh, under U1 left, Psi left rotates with its own phase and under U1 right, Psi right rotates with its own phase, okay? Um, once we include the mass term, which is shown over here, uh, the mass term for the Dirac fermion couples left to right, left chiral field to the right chiral field, and therefore it breaks explicitly breaks the original symmetry down to the vector vectorial to the vector subgroup U one vector. Um, this U one vector is related to the transformations when the, the left rotation equals to the right rotation. So when both left and right fields rotate in the same way, then the mass term is invariant. It doesn't change. And uh, so U1 vector is really the, the, the unbroken um, global symmetry of this Lagrangian in the presence of the mass term. So in particular, Associated to this um, symmetry, there is so we are there is alpha v the, the phase with which we rotate both um, left and right component, and then there is a conserved current. Neuter current of this uh, global symmetry is psi bar gamma mu psi. Okay. The orthogonal combination we call u one axial that will play a key role in this discussion. U one axial is a transformation where the right-handed phase is opposite to the left-handed phase. Okay, so alpha R equals minus alpha L, and this is realized on the Dirac spinner by this formula. So it's E to I gamma five alpha A uh, psi. Um, that's how the Dirac Fermion transforms under axial U1. I will call this also uh, sometimes axial transformation, sometimes chiral transformation. 
gamma five is the gamma matrix, which is minus one for the left uh, in the left-handed uh, corner, and plus one in the right right-handed corner. In such a way that uh, it uh, the left component and the right component uh, transform in in opposing opposing ways. So U1 axial is broken by the mass term, explicitly broken by the mass term. Okay, so let's consider the situation where the mass is not equal to zero. We can do the variation of the Lagrangian. This time it's not zero because it's not, it's not a, meaning it's not a symmetry. Instead, the, uh, the Lagrangian transforms by this the variation of the Lagrangian is given by this formula. So there is a alpha A is the infinitesimal axial or chiral transformation. Okay. The current computed by, by the, the, the denoter uh, for formula, the, the axial current is given um, here. And um, know that it, the axial current has a gamma five matrix in, in, the, in the product. So it's psi bar, gamma mu, gamma five psi. So this is the axial, the axial current. So the derivative of the axial current is equal to the variation of the Lagrangian. If it's a symmetry, it's zero, but it's not a symmetry here, it's explicitly broken. And therefore we arrive to this um, result namely that the, that the derivative of the axial current is proportional to the mass of the fermion, psi bar gamma five psi, okay. And um, current is, axial current is conserved. It's conserved when the mass is equal to zero and it's explicitly broken when mass is non zero. So I would like to remind you of the flavor counting that we did in the second lecture in particular, when we had a broken symmetry, okay, we could use it to remove the, the unphysical parameters. In this Lagrangian, we have one parameter, which is M, okay, and this is a priori a complex, a complex parameter, right? So the, the, the axial U1, which is broken, and we can use it to remove the argument of this um, of this complex parameter, namely the phase, and get a, a, a real parameter. In the end, mass is, is the real parameter. Okay, so we can use this uh, broken transforma uh, transformation to remove the parameter. This will be very important in the context of solving the, the strong CP problem later on. All right, so now let's go to quantum field theory. In quantum field theory, we are calculating correlation functions. In particular, I will use this shorthanded uh, notation that uh, the, the vacuum expectation value of the time ordered product is just in these brackets, okay? So we are calculating correlation functions and we are doing this by, do, by doing a path integral over field configurations, right? So here I have a path integral over the field psi and psi bar. I'm, I'm again using the same um, example. I have a Dirac fermion. So I'm doing a path integral over exponent of the action. Okay. And then to, to get correlation function of some operator, you are integrate, you are convoluting the, that operator. This is just how you do a path integral formulation of quantum field theory. So here I can have in this uh, Lagrangian other pieces with, which are represented by this dot, but, but for the moment, which, what will be inter interesting to us, uh, we will, uh, is just the, the kinetic term of, of psi bar i derivative slash minus m psi and derivative slash is, the, is gamma mu d mu, okay? So now I want, I want to come to the Schwinger-Dyson equations to, um, and, and these are uh, obtained by doing the change of, of the integration variables. So since I have this integral over all field configurations, I can just perform 
um, a change of variables and the integral should remain the same. So for example, I can change the field psi with, with some phase e to minus alpha x. Alpha, and now alpha actually depends on x. I can do it. I'm just using that alpha is just some arbitrary scalar function. And this is not the gauge uh, symmetry transformation because I don't, I don't change the, the photon field, okay? I'm just doing um, redefinition of the variables in the integral, okay? So the first thing that has to be checked is the, the measure of the integral, d psi, d psi bar of this path integral. It turns out that the measure of the integral is invariant under this transformation. Namely that the Jacobian of the transformation is one, okay? So this is a very important statement that the measure of the path integral for this specific transformation is invariant under the field redefinition. And in the following, I will try to prove this or sketch the proof. So whenever I go and prove something, I will put these, okay. And it will be a little bit technical. So um, when these brackets finish, then we are back with the, with the big picture, okay. Okay, so now the purpose of the next few minutes would be to show that the measure is invariant under field redefinition. So first of all, we are doing a path integral over the Grassmann numbers. Fermionic fields are Gra Grassmann numbers, right? And they have a funny properties under int integration. So for example, the integral of d theta of theta is one, okay? Um, so the, the Grassmann numbers are anti-commuting numbers, right? This means also that the Jacobian has funny properties. So for example, if you do a redefinition of this type, theta goes to a theta, where a is just a, an ordinary complex number. Then after the change of variable, the, the Jacobian picks this inverse a to minus one. Okay, so there is this inverse for the, for the Grassmann uh, numbers. Okay, we will use this inverse um, uh, shortly. Um, yeah, shortly later. In particular, we will we will use it over here. So the the measure of the the path integral d psi bar d psi will be uh, this j factor for for j c for psi bar and j for psi. Okay in j for psi, and then there will be this inverse because we are talking about the Grassmann numbers. So, so what is a path integral? So we are, we are discretizing space-time, we have a lattice, and for each point on the lattice, um, we have one integral over the field. So there are multiple integrals, and uh, actually capital N integrals, and uh, the, the continuum limit is taken when this n goes to uh, infinity, okay? One notable example of path integral in, uh, for fermionic fields, for, for Grassmann fields, is this one. This is relevant, for example, when you discuss uh, free Dirac theory, okay? So there is um, this uh, theta i and theta i bar, i and j are actually, so there is this, I and J, I and J actually represents different space-time point. And then there is this product, okay. So this is equal to the determinant of A. So let's get back to our um, field redefinition, the change of variables in the integral. So I will do some linear transformation of the, of the field. Psi, there will be this delta operator linear transformation of, of psi of x and, and this likewise for delta c. Delta c will be the transformation of psi bar of x in, in, in general terms. So now this jc, the Jacobian factor, is the determinant of this um, uh, operator. Um, 
So note that we are discretizing over space time. So this delta is effectively a matrix um, with some uh, i and j um, indices. So we, we can use uh, now the, the relational linear algebra. The determinant is equal to the exponent of the trace, right? Of the log of delta. This is just um, the identity for, for matrices. Okay. The determinant is the exponent of the trace of the log. Now, what is the trace in the continuum limit? So the trace in the continuum limit is the integral over all uh, space-time. There is this uh, bra vector x and um, cat x. These are the eigenstates of the position operator. And this uh, capital trace is now the Dirac trace. The small trace is the trace over everything and the capital trace is just in the Dirac space. Okay, I'm writing it in this general form because we will use it later on for the axial transformation. At this point, let's go back to this vector transformation, namely where we rotate chiral fields, left and right chiral in the same way. And the difference between psi and psi bar, the charge conjugate is only in this sign, plus or minus one. So let's plug this operator into, sorry, into this formula over here. We can take um, plus minus psi in front and we will have something which is real, okay? And the, then the, this means that JC times J equal one. So the product of JC times J equal one. And um, that means that this, uh, the measure stays invariant. Okay, so you see this here. And as you already anticipate, this will not, this is not gonna be the case for, for, for the axial transformation. With vector transformation, this is the case. The measure is invariant. So now I stop. With the, with the derivation, okay? So you can uh, tune in again. But the purpose of this proof was to show that the measure is invariant. So now, so we do the, the, field, the, the, we do the redefinition and the path integral stays the same and then we can expand in alpha x. Alpha of x is some infinitesimal change scalar function. The first term comes from the variation of the Lagrangian, the kinetic term of the Dirac field. Uh, there is derivative because alpha is a function of x. And then the second term comes from, from this uh, specific operator that we are putting in. So we have this one and that one. So we are putting psi, psi bar. So it comes from here, okay? Now this has to hold for arbitrary alpha. This equation has to hold for arbitrary alpha of x. It's just the redefinition of the change of variables in the integral. Um, and there, from here we can derive schwinger dyson equations. And in particular, uh, so we have a derivative of the of the green function inside which we have the current. And this current is the, the current associated with the, with, the, with the global symmetry U1 vector. So this derivative of the, this correlation function is zero in, for all X, except when X is equal X1 and X2, and we have these contact terms. So this is basically the, the, the manifestation of the, of the symmetry Noether theorem at, at the quantum, in quantum field theory. This set of equations gives you a relation between correlation functions. It, co the, it relates different correlation functions one to, other, one to another. And these are the well-known word Takahashi identities. So the U1 vector, 
is the symmetry of the classic um, Lagrangian. It's also the symmetry of quantum, is of classic field theory, classical field theory, and also of the quantum field theory. And it realizes in, in, in this way through these equations. Okay, any questions so far? Very good. So now we will come to U1 axial, okay. And this one is actually anomalous. The global chiral symmetry, U1 axial, where the field changes by gamma five, when we are setting them to zero, okay. So th this is uh, the, the symmetry of the Lagrangian when the mass is zero, right? So the global chiral symmetry of the Lagrangian with mass equal to zero is in fact not the symmetry of the quantum theory. So that is the statement. It is not the symmetry of the quantum theory. In particular, the classical action is invariant, but the path integral measure is not. Okay. And we will prove this, that the path integral measure, even though the classical action is varied, the path integral measure is not. And this means U1 is anomalous. All right. So in the next uh, couple of minutes, I will try to prove this. I will take uh, again, so we are working in the same theory. So we have a, a Dirac fermion and there is U1 gauge interactions. And there is no mass term when we have when the mass term is switched off axial symmetry is the axial transformation is the symmetry of the classic lagrangian or the classic the classical theory so so we have to consider the path integral measure okay and let let's do it so again this is going to be a little bit technical Uh, so the, the U1 axial transformation on the field, remember those deltas, these linear transformations. Actually, now the, you can show the delta and delta C are the same, and then they are the, uh, the exponent of some beta of X, some scalar function, gamma five, okay? And this is, um, this is easy to show. So Psi goes to delta of Psi and then Psi bar goes to Delta of Psi um, bar, which is Psi dagger Delta dagger gamma zero. So if Delta is, um, so this is going to be Psi dagger E to minus I beta gamma five. So the minus comes from the charge conjugate gamma zero and gamma five and gamma zero uh, anti-commute. So you get uh, E to beta gamma five. Okay. So, so this J, the, the terms in the Jacobian, they look like this. They are the exponent of the trace. Now I put, um, I put the, this capital T, I already did the, 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 the trace over the, the space time. And then I have the, the, tra the direct trace left over here. So J times JC, the inverse, this is the, the full Jacobian, and this is not one. And we have to compute, we have to compute it, right? So when you want to compute this quantity, you see that the, it, the integral is naively divergent. So you have to do some tricks. So we will introduce the regulator lambda, which will be some high, high, high energy scale, some cutoff. Okay, so this is the starting relation. So we want to compute this trace. And we are saying that this trace is equal to this thing here. So we are putting some regulator and sending lambda to infinity. So formally nothing changes. So the, the exponent of one over lambda, when lambda goes to infinity is one. So the two things are the same, okay? Now we have to choose very carefully what this, um, what this numerator is. This pi hat slash, 
defined in this way. We are choosing it to be related to the covariant derivative, actually, of the of the U1 gauge uh, of U1 QED, right? So we, are, we have a U1 gauge symmetry. The P hat is the conjugate of the X hat, right? And we will have some uh, eigenstates of the conjugate operator, of the momentum operator. And in particular, note it, uh, these are you know, the usual formulas, the overlap between momentum and uh, position eigenstates, etc. So we will use these, uh, these, these relations that are familiar to you. So again, um, the, this pi, pi ten, uh, operator shown in here consists of the conjugate operator momentum oper operator, and then there is this uh, um, minimal coupling, right? So this is just a choice for, for the numerator to regularize the expression. So now we, we should uh, manipulate with, uh, with the Dirac um, algebra, which I will not go into detail. So for example, you can show that um, d slash squared is given by d square, and then there is this term. So then you can show that this p hat slash is p square minus e over two sigma mu nu f mu nu of x, okay? Right, so again, the, the, the trace that we want to compute is the integral, so sorry, is the limit when we send lambda to infinity. And now I put this uh, pi, I just wrote it over here. So I just wrote the um, pi hat slash squared. So it has this term pi hat minus e a mu squared, okay, in the expression. So now we want to evaluate this quantity. Notice that we have gamma five. So first thing that we could do is we can do the expansion in lambda because lambda is some big scale, right? Um, so gamma five is a very special Dirac matrix and you need at least, because there is a trace, right? You need at least four gamma matrices to have a non-zero trace. So trace of gamma five for so zero, one, two, and three gamma matrices inside is zero, it vanishes. The first non-trivial um, non-zero trace is actually this one. So when you have gamma mu, gamma nu, gamma alpha, gamma beta, gamma five, okay? And this gives you the, the Levi-Civita tensor, basically this trace. All right, so the leading term in this expansion comes actually at the quadratic order. So here in this sigma mu nu, we have two matrices. Sigma mu nu is the commutator of gamma mu, gamma nu. So we need to get four gamma matrices. So we have to expand to one over lambda to the fourth, okay? We have to expand one, one over lambda to the fourth. And you can do this and you can show that this trace equals to um, this thing over here. Very well. So there is a minus E square over two beta of X, beta was our parameter, Levi-Civita tensor, and then FF. So this is FF dual. Uh, the dual field is uh, the, the Levi-Civita contraction of the field, field strength. Now we are left with, in, the, in this limit, first of all, we have higher order terms. And then there is this, uh, um, and there is this term over here, which actually, so we are working in leading, uh, leading term in E, okay? Um, which can actually be computed. It's finite. So the, here is the computation over here. So first of all, you can go from, um, you're computing the trace, so you can go from position uh, eigenstates to momentum eigenstates. And then you go to the, um, you do a weak rotation. So this is really like doing one loop calculation, right? So you have this exponent here. And then you can do this um, um, 
change of variables, you can say that there is some T which is KE over lambda. So you can reabsorb the lambda dependence. And this then integral just becomes a number, I over 16 pi squared. There is no lambda dependence and it's finite. Okay. So we have computed, now we can send lambda to infinity. We have computed the Jacobian. Um, well, the Jacobian was uh, J, J, C inverse, J, J, C inverse. And the Jacobian looks like this. So it's, uh, remember we were computing the trace and the trace was in the exponent. So it was the exponent of, the, of, of this, this form here. When you do the axial transformation, you have the change of the measure. So you, you generate this, um, this Jacobian. And in fact, you can uh, actually put this Jacobian because it, it is the exponential, right? You can put it as a shift to the Lagrangian. Right, so we started again, let me be uh, slow at this point. This is a very important point, okay? So we started, um, so the technical part is over and now um, it's, it's a very important point. So we start with this, um, um, we start with this path integral over here. We do the field redefinition of the fermionic field, which is charged under uh, QED in the path integral we realize that the, the measure transforms the Jacobian is non-trivial and we calculated the Jacobian. And now actually we can put it as a term, as an additional term in the Lagrangian. But this, this is the essence of anomalies in quantum field theory. So even if we don't have a mass term, so if you look at these two things, Remember we chose some, some beta of X to be um, arbitrary variation. Uh, we can uh, now move this um, derivative to the current and we will get this formula. Of course, inside the, inside the correlation functions. So in particular that the, the derivative of the axial current is not zero, it is some, it's proportional to this FF dual and that there is this E square over eight pi square. So in the classical theory, uh, the current would be conserved because the mass is set to zero. In quantum theory, the current is not conserved. It is actually proportional to this piece, FF dual, which has this prefactor here. And this really looks like, a, like one loop effect. And you can have an alternative discussion of, of anomalies um, by, by looking at these triangle, triangle diagrams. Maybe this is more familiar. So you are computing the, let's say, pi naught to gamma gamma. And in these triangle diagrams with massless fermions, uh, you have this linear divergence. Okay. But here I chose to do it with the path integral and with this uh, measure. And in fact, this is the, the final result of, of the first part, which we will use extensively later on. Any questions about this? So, so, so again, in the classical Lagrangian, the derivative of the axial current would be zero. When we quantize the theory, the derivative of the axial current is actually has proportional to this uh, FF dual term. Or you can uh, see it in this way. If you have anomalous symmetry, and when you do a transformation on the Lagrangian, you will get an additional piece after you perform transformation, you get an additional piece to your Lagrangian, which is this one. Okay, that's it. And that's what we are gonna use uh, um, in the next hour. All right, so, so let's use this, um, the, these anomalies to, to, to discuss the strong CP problem. So let's assume that we have ma massless quark, okay. And we have this theta QCD term, right? So we, we have a Lagrangian, for example, now in, in the standard model, assume, assume we have a massless quark. 
I will argue that the QCD theta term is unphysical. So that's the statement. If you assume a massless quark, this anomalous U1 can be used to, ro to rotate away the theta term. So if I do the transformation, the chiral transformation of the quark, so if I take, um, psi, um, sorry, if I take psi goes to e to i alpha a uh, gamma five psi, under this transformation, uh, and the chiral transformation, the Lagrangian will get this additional piece as we saw from the discussion before. So the Lagrangian will transform into the Lagrangian and then this additional piece, which comes with the FF dual. In this, uh, so we have a massless quark, we are rotating that quark, which is charged under QCD. So it's, uh, it's GG dual. Okay. If you think about the triangle dry diagram, it's a U1 axial SU3 square anomaly, SU3 color anomaly. So what this means is that under the, under the U1 axial, the, the theta parameter rotates, it changes. So this theta, this one over here, will change when we perform an axial transformation by this additional alpha of a parameter, the transformation parameter. So this means that it's unphysical. In particular, we can choose a basis where theta of QCD is zero. So at this point, you should also remember this flavor counting, right? Um, where we use transform, broken transformations to, to remove the parameter from the theory. Here we are using anomalous symmetry to remove the parameter. So again, if we have a massless quark, we can use a chiral rotation related to this quark. Uh, quark meaning its color, its, cup, its uh, charge under QCD. And then there will be this um, uh, anomaly QCD and related to QCD, QCD interactions, which will allow us as we do the transformation to shift the theta parameter, okay? And then we can choose a basis where the theta parameter is small. It's clearly, it's, it is unphysical. It won't have physical consequences. However, in the standard model, the, the quarks are massive, okay? In the, in the literature, there was actually a lot of debate uh, if, if one perhaps can uh, set the, the up quark mass to zero. This would immediately solve the strong CP problem. There would not be no physical effect. Uh, however, lattice QCD showed that um, the up quark mass is non-zero uh, with, with great significance. And, and the, that, that solution is um, um, more or less ru ruled out. Okay, so the quarks are massive in the standard model. What does this mean? So when, when the quarks are massive, U1 axial is actually explicitly broken by the quark mass term. It was the, the first exercise we did in the beginning of the last class. So U1 axial is explicitly broken by the quark mass term. Right? So remember, if, if you have a mass term, non-zero mass term, and you do the axial or the chiral transformation, you get this additional piece. The Lagrangian is not invariant. Explicit breaking of the symmetry already at T. So this symmetry cannot be used to remove the theta term. In fact, well, to, to remove the, the, the CP violation. In fact, there are two effects, two, two things happening when you do U1 axial transformation. First of all, you are changing the argument of the mass which I call theta f. Yeah, so mass is some complex parameter and uh, this argument simply shifts by two alpha a under ax axial transformation. Also, it is simply comes from here. This simply comes from here, right? Um, and the second effect is that because of the anomaly, you are shifting the, the, the theta term in the Lagrangian. 
But there is a quantity which is a phase which is invariant under, under U1 axia. So if you take the difference between the two, between theta QCD and, uh, uh, and the theta F, theta F meaning of the fermion mass matrix, this difference is invariant under uh, U1A. So no matter in which basis you are is the same. So we will, uh, okay. And this is the, this is the, the physical CP violating phase. So this phase cannot be removed. So a chiral trans rotation uh, moves the phase back and forth between theta QCD and theta phi. But theta bar does not change. Theta bar being the difference between the two. And if you have many flavors, this uh, generalizes to, the, to this uh, equation. So theta bar becomes um, the difference between theta QCD and the argument of the determinant of M. Now M is the matrix of, for fermion mass matrix if you have many flavors. So this quantity is invariant under U1A. Basis independent and is therefore physical, cannot be rotated away. All right. Now we come to the question, but what is the effect? How, how does it realize? Like where does it leave, uh, which observable, etc. So one important thing about uh, this, uh, this interaction, the GG dual or FF dual, is that in fact, it can be written as a total derivative, okay? So, um, please have a, a closer look to this relation. So if you have this um, levi chevita contraction of two Fs, then you can write this as um, a total derivative of some object. This object called K mu is the, the so-called chern uh, simons current. And it's given by this uh, formula. So it's, um, it's uh, epsilon uh, mu nu alpha beta. And then you have a AF and A cube. Okay, so the, the gauge indices are saturated by this um, uh, structure constant. And the Lorentz indices are saturated by, the, by this Levi-Civita tensor, okay? So when we have a total derivative in the, in the Lagrangian, if a term is total derivative in the Lagrangian, it does not contribute to the Feynman diagrams. So it doesn't show uh, in perturbation theory at any order. Uh, why? Because you know this derivative, uh, when you derive the vertex Feynman rule for that local operator um, is proportional to the, moment, the, to the total momentum, right? And the, to the momentum is conserved at the vertex. Right? So the momentum concerning the vertex, so this doesn't show in Feynman diagrams. So you would conclude maybe that this effect is zero. Um, however, this is not the case. Um, we have a, a, a effect which, which comes at the non-perturbative level, non-perturbative effects due, due to instantons. And I will talk about this. Just, just to make sure that at this point we understand we are on the same page. So I am using the chiral rotation to go to a basis where, where theta f, the fermion phase is zero. And I put the physical phase entirely into, into the into GG dual term in the Lagrangian. So I choose a basis where the physical phase is entirely in the GG dual. Then I realize that GG dual is actually a total derivative of some current. It doesn't show up in the Feynman diagrams, this momentum conservation of the vertex. However, it leads to non-perturbative effects. The reason why it leads to non-perturbative effects is that uh, when we perform, when we calculate the action, uh, which means the integral over d4x of, of gg dual, which is now the total derivative of uh, Chern-Simons current, this is not zero. 
Usually this thing is, is, for example, if the fields drop very fast at the infinity, this can be uh, written as the integral over, over uh, a surface. If, if you know the fields drop very, very fast, then uh, th th this would uh, go to zero. But in fact, in QCD, this is not the case. Why? Well, because uh, to put it in very simple words, there are these instanton configurations. They are gauge field configurations, which at very large R, at very large R goes to infinity, it, they drop as one over R, okay? So now when you move the integral over, over the volume to integral over the surface, this is the, the surface. So we have four dimensional uh, volume and then we are going to a three dimensional surface. So this derivative uh, goes away. And now if the fields drop, if the field drop is one over R, then if you look at the form of this um, uh, current, there is this A cube term over here. So indeed we will get one over R cube and the surface integral will be finite. So there will be a non-perturbative effect, sort, sort of, uh, it's a global effect. So it's, a, it's called the topological uh, charge effect. I mean, so locally doesn't contribute. So in Feynman diagrams, there are no vertices, but uh, there is this global effect through the instantons. So what are these instantons? These are classical uh, solutions. So we are looking for, for the saddle point of the action uh, we are working in the Euclidean coordinates where we have imaginary time. If we have an imaginary time, then the weight of each field configuration is the exponential of minus S. And the classical configurations give the most important uh, weight, weight, okay? And in particular, these instantons um, are, um, uh, are, are those configurations. They also satisfy this um, equation of motion basically. So this is explicit um, solution, instanton solution. So it's a, it's, so it's a, it's a solution for the gauge field uh, A of uh, A mu. It's a function of X of space time point. Then there are these group indices over here. And then there is this uh, interesting parameter which is called rho. So you, you can do this exercise. You can convince yourself that this really solves the equation of motion this field configuration. And you can see what I was talking about that, um, that at, large, uh, at large distances, this really goes as one over R. So it, it's X nu over X square, okay? And it won't die out uh, when you perform the integral. Okay, so this um, solution, these instanton solutions, they, they are there for every row. Row is just an arbitrary parameter which has a mass inverse mass dimension, it's a scale. So for every row, it's a, it's a valid solution. And this row is the size of the instanton. Sort of the, the instanton solution, but Blake's scale invariance is introduces this row, the scale row. Um, so we can compute the action, the instanton action. So we can put the, so for this solution, we can plug it back in in the action and calculate. This first piece will come from the um, kinetic term and this will be from the FF dual, GG dual. So the path integral, the, the bottom line is that the, the path integral, the correlation functions would depend on this parameter theta, okay? However, the instanton calculation is unfortunately not reliable. We cannot have a, quantitative predictions, it just it's some qualitative evidence. And, and the reason is the following. So if you look closely to this, um, to this term over here, so this is the, the, the QCD coupling evaluated because there is running, it's evaluated at the instant on scale. And we know that at large dis distances, QCD confines. So the coupling becomes non-perturbative. And in fact, uh, the, the the result is actually dominated by that regime where, where coupling is large. We have exponential of minus uh, 
8 pi square over coupling square. So when coupling is large, that dominates the, the, the expression, the path integral. So we are dominated by large instanton contributions, instanton contributions, and um, perturbative calculation is not reliable. So that the classical approximation fails, you know, that the, that the expansion in, in the Planck constant is basically a loop expansion. Okay. Anyways, this was a, the instant discussion is useful just, just to simply see that at least for short distance instantons where the calculation is um, reliable, we see that there is effect or, or that there is, a, there is a dependence on this parameter theta. Uh, we can use another method for dealing with non-perturbative QCD in some specific limit, which we already discussed a lot in, in the Composite Higgs lecture, lecture five. Namely, we can use another tool, the chiral perturbation theory. Due to have quantitative calculations. Um, so the chiral perturbation theory is the low energy effective field theory of QCD. In particular, where the energy exchanged in the process. So if we are looking at some processes where the energy exchanged is uh, uh, below the, the, the QCD scale, then chiral perturbation theory is a good, is a great tool for doing non-perturbative calculations. Okay. So now I will remind you very quickly what we discussed in lecture five. So I will consider for, sim for, for simplicity, uh, two dynamical quarks, they are massless and the rest, the rest of the quarks are integrated out. So up quark and down quark. Therefore the, the global symmetry of QCD G is SU2 left cross SU2 right cross U1 vector uh, vectorial cross U1 axial. So the U1 axial is the one which is anomalous and uh, that one will, uh, will not have associated the Goldstone bosons to it as we discussed. The, 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 that one is the broken at quantum level. So the, there is a confinement in QCD The, the confinement in this phase transition with where the where this operator psi left bar psi right ij gets a vacuum expectation value a non-zero vacuum expectation value in the qcd vacuum which is the same for both up and down quarks that this condensate and the condensate of qcd breaks the the the, the global symmetry down to the down to a subgroup H. The subgroup H is SU2V, which we called isospin and U1 vectorial, okay? All right, so to describe the, the dynamics at low energies, we include the dynamical fields, the light fields, pseudonumbo Goldstone bosons, in particular pions. So there are three pions pi naught, pi plus, and pi minus. And we constructed, if you remember, the U, U of X matrix, which was the exponent of the I pi uh, pi on over, over F pi was the pi on decay constant. And with this, the field content, we could write down the Lagrangian as an expansion in an EFT expansion with the leading term being this one. So F pi square trace of derivative U derivative mu u decker, okay? So the explicit breaking comes from the quark masses. The trick is the following. So we will now choose to work in a basis in which theta QCD is zero. So we are using U1 axial rotation to move the theta QCD, to set theta QCD zero, but to move the physical theta bar into theta F. So there will be this additional piece, okay? 
So we are in the basis where GG dual term in Lagrangian is zero, but the physical CP violating phase is put as the overall uh, phase in the in the mass uh, matrix. Fine. So the, the, the Lagrangian which comes with the, the, the breaking of chiral uh, symmetry is this one. So remember we have a trace of M uh, U dagger plus uh, uh, M dagger U charge conjugate. And this is just this, uh, you know, we discussed this Purion analysis. Yeah, for details, uh, I refer to, to, to lecture number five, where we discussed at length uh, how, how you do, how you construct the chiral KPT, uh, chiral perturbation theory. So now let's see what is the effect of this, um, uh, of this phase. So when you now do the, the, the math, so you expand this, you will get this additional contribution over here. So the, the first term uh, we said was the vacuum energy because it, that does not depend on the, um, the first term does not depend on the fields. There are no pions there. So it's a, it's a, it's a vacuum energy. And now you can see that the vacuum energy is theta bar dependent. So there is a dependence of theta bar. Um, the, remember the second term was it gives the, the mass to the pions, right? And therefore we can express the, this, this parameter V in terms of, uh, of M pi, F pi and the mass of the pions and mass of the quarks, sorry. The quarks get mass only if pi zero gets mass for only if we have non-zero quark masses, M U and M D. V cube uh, MU plus MD is uh, F pi square M pi square. The, the, this is a rather simplified discussion, but, but the, the, the quali qualitatively it's, it's okay. So the vacuum energy is a function of theta bar. In particular, it's a minus cosine of theta bar. So the minimum of the energy is over here where The minimum of energy is for theta bar equal to zero. So the minimum is for theta bar equal to zero. Well, okay, uh, theta bar is an input parameter in the theory. So it can have an arbitrary value. We just, from this calculation, we note that the, the energy of the vacuum is minimal if theta bar parameter turns out, turned out to be zero. But this actually is a hint for beyond the standard model. So what, there is a mechanism, you know, to have this uh, theta bar to be equal zero. So we can promote it to be a field, right? And then this would be a potential for the dynamical field. This would be uh, really a potential for the field. This E of theta bar would be a potential for some field. And that field is axion. Okay, so this I'm jumping a bit ahead. Okay, very good. So we use chiral perturbation theory. Uh, we use the, uh, the chiral transformation to remove the, the physical phase into the mass matrix. And then we treated it as a spurion in chiral perturbation theory. And then we derived the, the, the vacuum energy as a function of this parameter theta. We, we established the dependence on theta. We also noted that if theta would have been zero, we would have a minimum of energy. This will be the, the really hint for axion to say that, okay, if you promote this to be a field, then this would be a potential for a field and it will get this um, value, uh, meaning that there is no CP violation. So this was one quantity which we computed with chiral perturbation theory, but we can also compute another quantity, which is the neutron electric dipole moment. Um, using chiral perturbation theory for this uh, calculation is a bit borderline because neutron has a mass of one GeV roughly. However, we, what we care about is the, is the energy exchanged, okay? So, so we care about the energy exchanged because we are computing the electric dipole moment. 
so you can go through the formalis of chiral perturbation theory, and there will be a coupling of the, the nucleon doublet, proton and neutron. They are fundamental representation of isospin. They are doublet of isospin. And this doublet couples to pions uh, in the isospin invariant way. And then there are two couplings. So this TA are the generators of SU2 Pauli matrices, and this is invariant under isospin. So there are two couplings, sorry, the gamma five, the pseudoscalar and the scalar coupling. The pseudoscalar coupling respects the CP. It's actually quite big, this coupling, and it is determined from, um, from data. The other coupling is CP violating, okay? This coupling is CP violating, which I marked with red with this G bar pi and N. And that coupling is therefore proportional to theta bar. And it's also proportional to the up quark mass because in the limit of the, if we set up quark mass to zero, there wouldn't be no physical effect as we discussed, we could have rotated away. So there is also this numerical suppression here, which comes from the up quark mass. Now you can calculate the, the electric dipole moment, which I actually forgot to write. So it's uh, N bar, gamma mu, gamma five. Oh, sorry, not gamma mu. It's F bar, sigma mu nu, gamma five N, F mu nu. So this, this operator. Neutron is neutral, so it cannot have a, a minimal coupling. There is this sigma mu nu matrix, right? And then there is a, a field strength tensor. And gamma five is that we are talking about the, the electric dipole moment. So you can compute this loop. So in the loop, you have a proton running and the pions. One of the coupling is this one, okay? Is the CP violating coupling. And then this loop is uh, given by this formula. So it's MN over four pi square, one coupling times the other, and then there is this logarithm, there is divergence. So the, there are large theoretical uncertainties because the current perturbation theory is borderline and there's also this divergence over here. So this is really, this theoretical cal calculation is really an order of magnitude estimate. I mean, and it, it needs to re, re, be re, uh, refined. Perhaps in the future, maybe lattice QCD at some point might be able to do this. Nonetheless, the estimate, theoretical estimate is 10 to minus 16 electron centimeters times theta bar. Experimental limit is 10 to minus 20, 26, okay? And therefore the limit on theta bar is 10 to minus 10. Okay. Very good. I hope I convinced you that this really is a problem of standard model, that this, uh, this uh, the absence of CP violation in strong interactions seems to point to some structure beyond the standard model. For me, the U1 Peche Quinn symmetry is the most convincing solution to this problem. So it, wo it works the following way. So we assume that there is an additional, on top of the standard model, there is an additional global U1 symmetry, which I will call Peche Quinn by the uh, authors, which is actually anomalous under QCD. So U1 Peche Quinn, SU3, col uh, um, SU3 color square anomaly. So if you have this, if you postulate the existence of this uh, symmetry, when you do this, um, when you do this transformation, you want Peche Queen, your action or your Lagrangian will get a, this additional piece, which is GG, GG dual, GG dual. And therefore you can choose the, 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 the alpha Peche Queen phase to rotate away theta, okay? Okay, that, that is the idea. So there will be some ultraviolet complete model which does this stuff. The EFT picture that I have in mind is the following. When I integrate the, the, the heavy stuff and I am at very low energies, the lightest state 
of new physics could be some real scalar field, uh, axion, A of X, pseudoscalar field, um, which is actually the Goldstone boson of this Peche Equin, of this global symmetry, okay? So remember the Goldstone boson transforms with the shift. So when we do U1A transformation, it goes into itself plus a shift, plus a constant. F pi is some to, to, to account for the mass dimension and alpha is this uh, Peche Equin shift. Okay, so if you write down your theory in an, EFT, in an EFT, the quarks are integrated away, okay? So we are not doing any uh, quark rotations because their effects is in higher dimensional operators, right? So we are not doing any quark rotations. They are integrated away, but we have this axion field. And um, the term which we can write down is this term. So the interactions of the axions go with the derivative because it's a pion, except for this term. Only this term doesn't have a derivative. And this is the term uh, from the anomaly. So under which, under which when you perform a transformation, it goes, uh, it basically shifts this way. It will give you this shift. So this is the EFT picture. You don't see the, the, the states which complete the model, but you only see the axion. So when you write down the EFT action, you have higher dimensional operators. Axion is a pion, so it has derivative interactions, but this interaction is not with the derivative. It, it is just like this, because when you shift the axion, you will really, really get this anomaly. The fact that uh, under this transformation, the action shifts. So what does this mean? Well, one can go to a basis where well, one can choose alpha PQ in such a way that theta bar is zero. And we can remove GG dual term from the, from the Lagrangian and we can, but we will stay with, with the coupling of some real particle with the GG dual. This particle is called, uh, it's a real physical particle axion. The other way to see this you can forget about these rotations or shifts. You can just style, start in a random basis and you have this operator. Then you can see that, uh, so you can take together axion and the theta term and calculate the vacuum energy. And the vacuum energy for the axion and the theta term combined will look like this. Because axion is a dynamical field, it will pick the value which minimizes the, the, the energy. And therefore the axion wav will be equal to the, the FA theta bar. And when you plug it in Lagrangian, the, the GG dual will, re, will get removed. Okay. Expanding this potential to the second order, you can get the axion mass. And the axion mass is m pi f pi over f a. f a is the decay constant. It's also the scale. Typically, it's the scale of the completion. And from some uh, astrophysical bounds from phenomenology, it has to be very big. It means that QCD axion is very light particle, typically. So I will show you this KSVZ model. Uh, named after the authors. In this model, I imagine that at this very high scale, I have a complex scalar field. So I have a complex scalar field phi, and it has this Mexican head potential. And it respects also the U1 patch equin. Together with this uh, field, there is also uh, some, some additional vector-like quark, heavy quark, psi, which is in fundamental of SU3. It's an SU3 color triplet. So the Lagrangian is invariant under Peche Quinn. So I have a complex scalar. I have a potential for the complex scalar, which is the Mexican head potential. 
I have a Yukawa interaction between the, the vector-like heavy quark psi, vector-like under QCD. So psi left and psi right transform the same way under QCD. And this phi. Now the Peche Queen uh, global symmetry charge, this is plus one, this is minus one half. And psi L bar is minus one half. So psi L and psi R have a different Peche Queen, opposite Peche Queen charges. Okay. Uh, and therefore there will be anomaly. So the, there is a Mexican head potential and this. Uh, it is minimum, the, the vacuum expectation value of the complex scalar field is FA, FA, and there will be two real scalar fields, the phase, and the phase will be a pion, which is uh, going along the, the valley. There will be a radial excitation, which is massive, some new massive particle. So after spontaneous symmetry breaking of Peche Queen, there will be this mass term for the, for, for the heavy guy. Okay, so for the heavy field. So the heavy field will get a mass which is proportional to this scale, the breaking scale, and times Yukawa coupling. And uh, in addition to that, uh, uh, there will be, this term will also give you interaction with the axion. So if you expand this exponential, you will get a coupling between axion and photon when, uh, with this psi running in the loop. Sorry, and then the gluon with the psi running in the loop. But we will not compute this loop. We will actually use the chiral rotation trick. So, so what is the trick? Well, before integrating away the psi field, we can actually do a, a, a rotation. So we will change psi to some new field psi prime in such a way to remove the dependence on this uh, exponential of the axion. So we are using the, the U, U1A rotation, sorry, U1 uh, Peche Queen rotation. So when we do the, this uh, rotation, the measure of the path integral will introduce the coupling between, A is now a phase, it will introduce AGG tilde in the Lagrangian. The chiral rotation will give us the AGG tilde term. So once we have done this, then, then the mass matrix for a heavy fermion, mass of the heavy fermion is uh, real and we integrate the heavy guy. But at low energy, the EFT picture, which I was talking about. So we get this Lagrangian. So we get, uh, yes. So we get this piece. Okay. Yes, and the theta term is zero as I discussed. All right, so axions are actually a very popular subject and they are searched for also experimentally. There are many, many attempts to, to look for them. I won't explain any phenomenology of axions. I wanna tell you that uh, the parameter space is not really very well, not, not covered. So this band over here is the prediction from these models for the QCD axion. And the experimental limits are not very good. Most of this uh, parameter this prediction is not covered by the experiment. Okay. That's all. Any questions? Just to make sure that I got it right. So the, the CP problem is the, the smallness of this theta that is dimensionless, right? And yes, this axion exactly. solution solves this by um, introducing a new scale and there there is no reason that this scale should be of some specific value right uh so yeah so the, the 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 smallness of this dimensional number points to existence of some short distance physics at some mm -hmm. scale mm -hmm. some high energy scale at some high, the dynamics of this high energy scale um um yeah is responsible for this like here, we've introduced some new scale FA, which is the, the breaking of this Peche Queen, mm -hmm. which gives you uh, then, um, there are these heavy modes that live on this scale, mm -hmm. but importantly, there is this Goldstone boson, mm -hmm. the axion of this global symmetry, uh, which actually um, is responsible for solving the problem. 
So Axion shifts in the same way as the theta parameter. And then we, we saw that the, the minimum of the energy, so the QCD, uh, the QCD um, minimum energy is obtained when the, when the Axion gets a wave precisely to, to remove the, the, the theta parameter to make it exactly zero. Mm -hmm. So if Peche Quinn symmetry um, predicts that it's exactly zero, that there is the, the, the issue of the quality of Peche Quinn. Perhaps at some high energies, Peche Quinn one might be violated. By example, gravity effects that come from Planck scale. And this would um, give non-zero theta term. So one has to make sure when constructing these models that the Peche Quinn symmetry has enough quality to stay within the experimental limits for the theta term. Okay. Yeah. And um, perhaps to follow up, um, so people are trying to actually measure the neutron electric dipole moment, right? Yes. And so far, these numbers are just bounds. Did I have I understood that correctly? They're yes, not... exactly. There is an upper limit on this, yes. And if they would succeed to measure it at maybe 10 to the minus 27, would the axion still be in, in business or? Uh, I think yes, because that, that would mean that, uh, um, that that would mean that this Peche Queen symmetry, the quality of it mm -hmm. uh, was, so it, there was some additional explicit breaking to it. Mm -hmm. mean, meaning that the quality of it was not, uh, um, you know, good enough. To, to make theta completely zero, but there is still some, uh, to, to, to remove CP violation completely, but there is still some residual uh, thing. So yeah, so, so from discovering theta prime being uh, 10 to minus uh, 11, let's say would not, uh, it would still be a puzzle. We mm -hmm. would measure it. We would, okay, it's not zero, but it's, uh, um, and the axion would still be viable. I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, sure. Ask uh, a question. As yes, well. please. Sorry, Go ahead. I'm a bit late. Um, no, no. So I've read about um, the CP problem before, of course, and then I wondered um, why we only talk about this for QCD. And so I read a bit and um, it said that, well, in principle, you could have this term also in the electric theory, but right, somehow but there, there you physical. can rotate it away. Yes, exactly. Can you maybe quickly comment how this works? I think it has to do with this total derivative again, but that then it doesn't contribute, but. Yeah, I, so there it can sure. be ro rotated away with, um, yeah. So there are these uh, U1s in the standard model baryon lepton number, which are anomalous. And they are global symmetries. And you can use those to, to basically when you do those, they are anomalous and they give you the, uh, the rotation and it will generate, uh, when you do this rotation, it will generate in Lagrangian WW dual, okay? Mm -hmm. And you can use that one to remove the, 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 the theta parameter for W. Oh, I see. Okay, so that's mm -hmm. uh, okay. That that's how it uh, how it works basically. Okay, nice. Thanks. So so, so the, you have to look at uh, the the full standard model, and you have to look at the, the 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 global groups, and then um, so you 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 can convince yourself that for electroweak you can remove it. Uh, you can remove this thing, while for the for QCD you cannot. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Welcome. Um, okay, that's it. So we are good. Thanks a lot for participating in this uh, in this course. Bye. Thank you for the lectures. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you, Admin.